For years, prospective Americans have struggled with the nation's immigration laws. As the situation currently stands, Congress is split between the decision to push immigration reform forward or continue to do nothing. But what many forget in this debate are the number of families that are separated on a daily basis due to deportation. Under the current administration, nearly two million people have been removed from the country. And although last year's numbers saw a drop from the 2012s, there's still much to be done. Joining us now to discuss is Raul de Molina of El Gordo y La Flaca. And we're also joined by Pablo Alvarado, who is executive director of the National Day Labor Organizing Network out of Phoenix, Arizona. And we're also joined by Arturo Carmona, who is executive director at Presente. Org. Thank you both for joining me. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Pablo, because this is this is a, I don't want to say a unique problem, but it's, it's a particularly important issue that we have to wrestle with right now. Absolutely. The reality is that there are 11 million people that are working very hard, raising families, uh, working in the fields, in construction sites, taking care of babies, cleaning homes, keeping gardens green, but they are being denied equality. They're being denied justice. And the reality is that deportation policies that uh, the Obama administration has been implementing are, are not helping in achieving that equality. And similarly, the Republicans have been pushing for a self-deportation policy. They push for the Arizona-style uh, laws, but have only marginalized further the immigrant community. So at this point, uh, we believe that the president needs to act in order to move this debate forward. Pablo, what is your organization doing to help move the, uh, the ball forward? I know they're doing a great deal. Well, uh, just tomorrow, there are 80 uh, um, events across the country where uh, people who are being harmed by the unjust status quo will demonstrate and will come and say this is the time for President Obama to stand uh, to the uh, extremist voices in the Republican Party and deliver a clear message to them. And that the expectation that our community has is uh, from the president to, Rep to the Republicans is, I will realize the undocumented community with or without you. If you don't like it, then come to the table to negotiate. But there is a general consensus now in our country, and that is that the end of deportation has become plan A. And there is also another consensus, and that is that the Senate bill, for instance, that was passed last year with both uh, uh, Democrat and Republican support, at the bare minimum, those people should be protected by the president. Also, there is a program that has given authority to local police to enforce immigration law. It's called uh, the Secure Communities Program. Uh, that program itself is responsible, responsible for the deportation of about 330,000 people. That's a program that President Obama nationalized. With the stroke of a pen, President Obama can say, I'm, not gonna, I'm no longer going to uh, utilize this deportation program. Uh, absolutely. Arturo, let me bring you into the conversation as well. Uh, El Presidente is doing a great deal of work as well. Talk to me about how you all are able to deal with some of the challenges uh, that Pablo just raised. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think first we got to recognize all the hard work that Endelon and all the, the organizations around the country have been doing. Uh, we, we've been organizing within our, uh, our sphere, making sure that millennials, that uh, young Latinos and Latinos across the board, along with allies, are, are communicating the level of frustration and the, the type of damage that the deportation policies of this administration are having uh, on Latino families and on immigrants in general. Just last week, we launched a national campaign called the Obama Legacy Project, which uh, frames uh, the question to, to the president. It's a momentous moment that we're in this week. Uh, the two million deportation is happening, and the president really has a choice. He's going to be remembered as the president that deported the most immigrants of, of, uh, compared to any other president in the history of this country, uh, that unleashed the most devastation uh, in the immigrant community uh, that we have ever seen in this country. Or he could follow a path where he could uh, provide relief to the immigrant uh, population, provide a more humane approach to the issue. And we're certainly doing all we can 
through actions through actions in different places around the country, mainly online mobilization, engaging uh, uh, through Twitter, Tumblr, uh, social media, and really mobilizing our folks to ensure that the message is, is clear. We're going to continue these activities over the next couple of months. And uh, we certainly feel that, that the narrative around the immigration debate has changed. Absolutely. From talking about a, a, an immigration bill that talked about militarization and excluding key portions of the population to now stopping the suffering and, and stopping the endless deportations that have haunted so many immigrants and separated so many families in this country. Absolutely. Raul, this is, Mark, yeah. Uh, Mark, uh, look, uh, with the show that I have with Gordon, the fact I travel over the United States, Texas, Los Angeles, even in Miami, and where I live every day, people that come and talk to me, people that have been living in this country for 10, 12, 15 years, they have been living here illegally, and their sons have been born here. And some of them have kids that are maybe three, four years old. Wow. Then the father is deported. And I know, for instance, people that, for example, the mother is a U.S. citizen, the kid was born here, and is a U.S. citizen, but the father is deported back, and they have to leave the kid here, sometimes with family members. When I mean it's the mother of this person who is deported, is a U.S. citizen, but he's been here living for years and had not been able, you know, to get their papers to, to stay in this country. And he had been deported, leaving the kids with family members, with friends sometimes. And why do they have to do this? They're separating families. These people are working extremely hard in this country, making this country what it is in, in places like New York City. I mean, everywhere that you go, Latinos are working here really hard. And I say, people that have no record, that have not done anything wrong, that they have got in trouble, why did they have to be deported when the kids are here in this country and are U.S. citizens? No, I, I, I see your point, and I think that's the key, what you just and, I, and I'm going to tell you, I believe Obama was reelected, and most people agree with this because of the Latino vote. Absolutely. And I, I wish an immigration reform would have been done during the last two years or so, like it was promised. And I think they're not doing enough for the Latino community. I, I, many people agree with you, and what we want to do is help put a face on some of those stories that you just talked about and, and some of the challenges that you all did. So later on, we're going to bring some actual people in uh, to talk about their own experiences. But right now, you know, it looks like the Congressional Hispanic Caucus has decided to take deportation policy into its own hands. On Thursday, the caucus sent a memo to Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson suggesting ways that the administration could, quote, end the needless separation of American families caused by deportation. Representative Luis Gutierrez said, our goal in the CHC is to save as many people as we can from the devastating effects of deportation and to put millions upon millions upon millions of people in a safe place. The memo lists 11 reasons or, or suggestions to increase deferred action on deportations and change the system that is responsible for the high number of immigrant removals. The CHC is set to discuss the memo with Secretary Johnson at a meeting next week, a meeting that was scheduled after President Obama called for a review of deportation policies. Arturo, how do you think the CHC's memo will do with the Department of Homeland Security? Well, we're, we're certainly hopeful that, uh, that this whole narrative around stopping the deportations uh, makes it, I mean, th there's no question that the, the administration and the Secretary of Homeland Security are getting the message. There's been a, a, an increased level of discussions and, and meetings happening over the last two months. But we're still seeing a lot of resistance towards the narrative around ending the deportation. And so we're, we're still very concerned and we're going to continue to organize uh, to make sure that our elected officials, uh, both in Congress and at the federal level, particularly President Obama, uh, put a stop to, to, to the suffering and put a stop to the separation of families. So I think uh, we're starting to see uh, increased attention, but there's a lot of work to be done. Absolutely. Pablo, that work we thought would be done after Obama's successful re-election campaign. As Raul pointed out, promises were made, elections were won, largely because of those promises, or at least the implicit promise that our immigration reform was, uh, was imminent. And yet we've seen so little change, we've seen so little work. How do we move the ball forward? It's, it, from our perspective, it's, it's very simple. President Obama said, uh, and it made a decision of being aggressive in the implementation of immigration law with the idea that by being tough on immigrants, he would persuade extreme Republicans to come in and support immigration reform. Obviously, that hasn't worked. We should have figured that out the minute that 
the extreme voices in the immigrant uh, in the in the Republican Party began asking for his birth certificate uh, because they believe that he's an undocumented immigrant. We should have known by then that the enforcement only approach wasn't really working. Uh, a few weeks ago, the Republicans voted to defund uh, the child the deferred action for child childhood arrivals programs, which has uh, stopped the deportation for, for uh, many. Um, uh, undocumented youth. Uh, that, that's, a, that's an indicator that Republicans are going backwards. Uh, a few weeks ago, the, the Democrats uh, in the House introduced what they call the discharge petition, which would have forced a vote on the Senate bill uh, and the floor of the House. Uh, they, they know full well that in order for that petition to be successful, they need at least 17 Republicans to support it, which means that 17 Republicans will have to betray their own political party to support uh, this effort. This is highly symbolic. Obviously, these strategies are not working at all. Uh, the only person who has the ability to move this debate forward at this moment, moment is President Obama by acting uh, forcefully and by telling them, I am going to legalize the undocumented people with or without you. And I bet you they will come to the table. And, when, and it's no longer whether uh, another consensus that's nationally, and it's reflected in the fact uh, that uh, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus is sending this letter, is that President Obama has the legal authority. And for us, you know, uh, the way we see it, he has, he has the moral obligation to act. So he can easily uh, expand DACA, the, the Deferred Action for child, Childhood Arrival, to the extent of the law possible. He can ensure that people who will be, who will, who will be uh, the direct beneficiaries of the Senate bill won't have to uh, fear deportations anymore, and the Secure Communities Program, and the Streamline uh, Operation Program in the U.S.-Mexico border. He has to dismantle a deportation machine that he himself has built. And this is, these are part of the demands, and that's why 80 events across the country, people will be making that demand public. Absolutely. Just in the last, one thing I wanted to add, just in the last uh, uh, couple of months, the president had lost over 20 points uh, in his approval ratings. The, pl the president is doing this for what? To try to bring the Republicans into the table? The uh, strategy is obviously not working. If the president wants to do something that's really going to energize Latinos and is really going to do the right thing morally, he needs to stop these deportations. It's senseless to continue in this course. Absolutely. One of the ways we want to help push that conversation forward is to put a face on these issues and to hear the stories of some of the families that deportation has torn apart. Our first family was separated over nearly seven years ago. Evelyn Rivera's mother was deported back to Colombia after being stopped and detained for driving without a license. She joins us now from Orlando, Florida, uh, Evelyn, and her mom, Yolanda, joins us from Medellin. We are also joined by Harit Andrade, whose father didn't come home one night after being stopped by the police in 2012. I want to thank you all for joining me. This is uh, absolutely stunning uh, to hear uh, that minor traffic infractions lead to the breakdown of entire families. Obviously, the point isn't the infraction. The point is a set of immigration policies that make this so easy to have. Mark, and I want to say something on this. These are people that have not broke any laws. Right. The only law they're breaking is that they're living in this country illegally. Their sons are born here, and some kids are only, like I was saying before, three, four years old. Yeah. Why can't they really, Republicans and Democrats, do something? And maybe they, they pass a law or something that you pay a penalty. Yeah. But when you have papers to work in this country, you're going to start paying taxes. And the only one who's going to benefit is the United States. So if these people have been working here for so many years, look, give them a status to work here legally, and they will be paying taxes. Exactly. And their sons are already U.S. citizens. It makes sense to me. Evelyn, uh, obviously you you felt this directly. Uh, you've recently reunited. Tell me about what happened. Yeah, um, well, first of all, thank you, Mark and Raul, for having my mom and I on the show. Um, also want to appreciate the shout out that you gave to Colombia's national team. We're very excited for the World Cup. Um, but on a more serious note, um, my mom and I uh, were able to reunite this past summer at the Nogales border. Um, she traveled from Colombia to Nogales, Mexico. I traveled from Florida all the way to Nogales, Arizona, um, where we were part of this campaign or this 
action called Operation Butterfly. Um, it was myself and two other friends of mine who hadn't seen our moms in over six years. And it was one of those moments that I will remember for the rest of my life. Um, and I will cherish um, those 12 hours that I got to hug and cry and laugh with my mom um, and just hoping and keep fighting for the day that we can be re reunited permanently. Absolutely. Wow. I, I, can you say a little bit more about sort of what the, the challenges were of dealing with the moment before you reunite in the days and weeks and years before you reunite? I mean, what kind of impact did this have on your family? Um, wow, there's there's a lot that one, right, I, I come from a mixed status family. Um, so my sisters are both U.S. citizens. Um, my younger sister was 13 at the time. Um, so it was one of trying to to raise her uh, and sort of protect her from what was going on. Um, at the same time, my older sister was finishing her bachelor's at Florida State University and um, really still supporting her education and making sure that that was one of the reasons why my parents were courageous enough to move to the United States. Um, and just trying to figure out how we would continue as a family with my dad here, um, who was currently undocumented at that time, and the decisions of whether we would move back to Colombia or whether we would stay here. Um, and just how we would be able to continue the day-to-day -day things of what it means to be a family that lives in different countries. Absolutely. And Yolanda, obviously you're, you're on the other side of this, uh, both geographically and in terms of the, the parent-child relationship. What impact did it have on you? How did, how did you make sense of all this? Well, that day was so difficult because what Evelyn said that she gave me hug and kisses, but we were hugging and kissing bars that were so hot. And, and hard was very, very difficult. And Yolanda, mi corazón está con ustedes, ¿verdad? Eh, this is so sad, really. This yeah. is so sad. This is incredibly sad. When I see the images of you, Yolanda, and you connecting and reconnecting, it's beautiful. But this should have never happened in the first place. I know. My husband and I raised our daughters to to serve God, people in the country. And what we got is, was to separate the family. Very, very difficult. And we are so proud of Evelyn because when that happened, my oldest was at the university. My husband got almost crazy. He couldn't do anything. Evelyn was the one that has to think and do things for us. Wow. Even though she was with our legal documents, it's, very, it's been very, very hard still. Raul, this is exactly what you were talking about, people who work hard, who value education, who are trying to do better for their children. Uh, uh, and Mark, the, the most important thing that I'm saying is people that have not broke the law. Right. People that have been living in this country without doing anything wrong. Yeah. Some of them, this is their house. They've been living here longer than they live in their country. Yeah. They call this their home, the United States of America, even though they don't have papers to live here. Some of them have been living here for 20 years, illegally. Their sons were born here. Why separate them? Yeah. No good. No. And if you go to New I mean, every time I go here in New York City, you go to any restaurant, the people that are working in the front of the restaurant or in the kitchen, you know, almost 80 to 90% then are Latinos. Yes. And some of these people may not have papers and are working in this city. What happened? If all these people are gone, I don't see New York will work. America wouldn't work. That's, exactly. That's, that's what makes it so In tragic. any major city. And in every, you know, there are people, Latino now, everywhere in this country, are over 50 million Latinos living in this country. Yeah. So, you know, one more time, the president got elected thanks to a Latino vote. And I'm going to tell you something. For the next elections, we're not talking about Democrats. The Republicans are not doing anything either. Yeah. So I don't know what's going to happen. Right. Everyone has punted on this issue when they absolutely should not have. I want to bring Haritha into this conversation because you, too, have gone through the pain and the, just the, the, the familial destruction of, being, uh, of dealing with deporta deportation. Talk to me about what happened with you. Definitely. Thank you for having me. Um, like you said, one night my dad didn't come home. I got a call and uh, it was from the detention center uh, saying that he had been stopped on a traffic stop. And, and it's right, it's programs like Secure Communities that are uh, criminalizing uh, our parents, our families. And so it is with that, the graphic that's on the screen right now, um, that we launched a campaign to stop my dad's deportation. And it has been the community 
that has come together to stop these deportations, uh, to make sure that families aren't being separated and that this pain that it, it that truly causes families stops and ends now. And especially with uh, organizations like Endalon who have been uh, reaching out, uh, we have been able to stop deportations and we have been able to stop the deportation of my dad. Well, you were before you could stop it, you still were separated from him for a few months. Some people think, oh, two months away from your father is nothing. Uh, not the case. Definitely not the case. Two months away from my dad. Um, I had experienced that coming to the U.S. My parents weren't able to get their visas issued at the same time me and my sister uh, came. So we waited for our parents here in the U.S. for about four years. And so we knew what that was like already. And we fought hard <laughs> For those two months so that my parent, my dad would come back home and so that we were able to keep him in the country wow. for sure. Do you, do you worry that this could happen again? I mean, I know you said you're able to stop the deportation, but it sort of looms in a way. It does. And so that's what I feel like the conversation has shifted in terms of the community fighting and putting pressure on President Obama to stop these deportations because you never do really truly feel safe when you see a police officer around, although that's supposed to happen. Um, you feel a sense of fear um, and you want to hide. So that shouldn't happen. That should be uh, the opposite. Absolutely. Arturo, you've heard uh, these people, uh, Evelyn, Jared, Yolanda, uh, talk about their own experiences. And you've dealt and heard these experiences regularly uh, in your work. How do you think the American people would respond if they were able to hear stories like this versus the extreme narratives of criminals and drugs and guns, all the sort of bad news we hear, which isn't really reflective of most Latinos who are simply trying to live a life of, of, of happiness and prosperity. Well, we're seeing that, um, as Pablo referenced uh, earlier, the American population is trending in that direction and that in a direction where they don't want to see more separation. Just a recent poll uh, noted that the majority of Americans do not support a deportation solution. They support the legalization solution and an end of the deportations. More and more families across uh, the country are, are seeing this and are realizing we need to make sure that they hear more of these stories. Yeah. Because Absolutely. We Can I add something to our serious point? Overwhelming support. And we also want to make sure that the president, and we also, you go, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Thanks, Arturo. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, to your point on legalization um, and that uh, we need to maintain a balance. It's very important to maintain a balance on keep uh, in pressuring uh, a legislative approach as well as an administrative approach. Um, we've seen that Obama's finally starting to act, right? He um, hopefully through it was through the meeting that he had with Luis Gutierrez that um, Luis Gutierrez came out to say that the GOP has about uh, 34 days to, uh, to act on something. And so it's putting pressure on the House uh, leadership, especially. Uh, and I think we've seen that uh, through the work that I've been doing with the Bridge Project, especially we've been here in D.C., um, following the work that the GOP is doing and its leadership. For example, Mr. Goodlad um, had hosted a conversation with advocates here in D.C. Uh, at the museum. And his comments definitely reflected that there, the work is still happening towards a legislative approach, um, which, which could potentially mean a path to legalization. And so um, alongside working with uh, stopping the deportations, that is very important. Absolutely. Uh, before we go, Yolanda, I, again, I know you and your daughter have the opportunity to speak uh, more now than before, but you're still separated. Is there anything you would want to say to her now that you two are both uh, right here together? Oh, Evelyn, I cannot wait for the day that I give you a hug and a kiss and have to hold my hands and sleep with you. <laughs> and tell you how much I love you and how much I miss you and you, your sister and your dad. Wow. Evelyn, do you want to say anything to your mother? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm blessed enough to be able to talk to her every day, thanks to technology, but... Uh, mommy, you know, I love you so much. Um, I will keep fighting to make sure that you come back. Um, and like I made uh, the promise and the commitment to this movement that I don't want anybody else to suffer um, deportation or family separation like my family did. And so I'm going to make sure to honor that to the very end and to make sure that my family is reunited. And 
that Obama acts because we just can't wait any longer. Absolutely. Raul, I'll give you the last word on this. No, I'm going to tell you how hard it must be that these people and their families at home and they're waiting for their husband and sometimes it doesn't show half an hour later or an hour later and every day you're living yeah. that is he's going to come home, is he's going to be stopped by the police and deported and they will never see them again for years yeah. because maybe they don't have the money to travel to the country and see them. You know, you know how it's to live like that every day that you're worried, oh, my husband didn't come back. It's already, he was supposed to be here at 7 p.m. It's already 8 p.m. He's not answering the phone. And they don't know what happened. And this is, is the way they're living their life every it's single terror. day. Living under terror. People that have done nothing wrong. They could say, well, they're here illegally. Yeah, but they, they are illegally here for years. They've been living here for 10, 15 years. And they've been working very hard in this country and helping here also. Because he said, well, not working here. And they're not taking the job from anyone. Okay? Yeah. Because they're doing jobs that other people may not want to do. Absolutely. We've learned a lot from the stories of uh, Evelyn, Jarrett, and Yolanda, as well as the analysis of Pablo and Arturo. Thank you all for joining us, Raul. It's always good to see you, man. Thank you, and really. It's a pleasure to be here always. Absolutely. Stay with us at HuffPost Live. So much more coming up.